Hello, good afternoon. I'm Dav Bansal, a partner at Glenhouse Architects, and sitting here in our Birmingham studio to welcome you all to the Building Stories Talks, where we look at RBA award-winning buildings and invite the architects to share the stories behind their buildings and their experiences. We can all learn from seeing the innovation, the careful thought, and the hard work that goes into these projects, whatever their scale or complexities. Today, our special guests are Tom Rodica from McCrane & Lavington and Angus Moore Ryan from Demos Demetrius Ryan, who will be telling us the stories behind Ipsop Place Refactory and the Alice Hawthorn. Uh, I was fortunate to be one of the uh, national judges to visit the Alice Hawthorn in the small parish of Nunmonton in North Yorkshire. It was a lovely blue sky when we arrived in the perfect village and the old pub just sat in a collection of picturesque homes at the heart of the community. So it was simply utopia. But more of that from Angus later on. Before we start the presentations, please do feel free to send in your questions at any time for our Q&A session. McCrane and Lavington was appointed to design a new refactory at Ibstock Place School in Roehampton, an independent co-education school for pupils aged four to 18 years after winning an invited competition in 2016. The brief for the new refactory asked to replace existing piecemeal facilities, a small single-story brick building, the PVC conservatory and two wooden cabins into a single purpose built building whilst maintaining an ancient orchard. So let's hand over to architect Tom Wedeker to tell us more about it. Thanks for the introduction. That's great. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about Ibstock today, which um, came into the office in 2016, um, around the time of Brexit referendum, roughly. So it's kind of uh, a time when we're really excited to get out of the blue an invitation to um, take part in a design competition. Um, design competition that was paid um, by, by the school, which I would um, thoroughly recommend any potential clients um, follow suit. Um, and um, yeah, so the school itself sits in Roehampton um, on the edges of the Alton Estate and Richmond Park. Um, and when we went to visit, we kind of blown away by the the possibility of the site um, and how uh, kind of luxurious the landscaping was in the school. Um, I kind of very keenly aware that this was the um, the last uh, building in a master plan um, overseen by the uh, head teacher Anna Sylvester Johnson, uh, and it was kind of her her parting gesture uh, from the school. Uh, so a, a really important commission um, and one that we really uh, got excited about from day one. Uh, so the school um, was originally housed in um, a domestic building, so it was a private house built in the early 20th century, uh, and the school referred to it as Main House, um, it's locally listed, um, and it kind of encapsulates the, the feel of the school really, which is that although it's a, a school of almost a thousand pupils, it feels very small and homely, um, but it had very much outgrown um, its existing facilities. Uh, so this is a view of the previous um, dining hall, uh, which was a um, building that had been extended many times, um, which um, had really come to the end of its useful life um, and struggled in a lot of ways environmentally. Um, the brief from the school was to uh, build a new refectory in the place of the existing uh, building. That was something that, uh, you know, as all architects do, initially we kind of tested that theory and thought, well, is there something more clever we can do? But there was a lot of really inherent qualities about the existing building that we really liked. Uh, we liked the exposed timber structure. We liked the top light. We liked the views out to the um, orchard. Um, and those were all qualities that really existed because of um, where the building was sited. And it was kind of right at the heart of the school campus. And we felt it was really important to maintain that. So um, our kind of initial thoughts um, on the building, I guess, didn't look dramatically different to um, what was uh, there previously. We, we wanted to keep this idea of top light coming in, um, but we kind of realized that the conservatory was woefully inadequate as a, as a comfortable place to dine. It was kind of very hard and uh, acoustically very challenging, but also just far too hot in the summer because it faced it faced west. Altogether, there's just kind of not that big open space that allowed the school to come together. So we kind of started thinking um, along the lines of a, a more, I guess, barn-like building, rather than having a lot of glazing on the western um, side, using some kind of covered walkway um, that could introduce some um, opportunity for pupils to 
um, to queue outside the building. Kind of formative ideas, idea of a barn, uh, and we kind of talked a lot about this idea of the the original country house and the ancillary buildings that might go next to it, and, and barn kind of seemed to really uh, fit that mold. Um, we become very conscious that we were going to be effectively putting a very big volume onto the site, um, but we wanted main house to still very much read as being the main element of the of the school campus. Um, and we're also kind of really aware how close we were to neighbouring residential buildings. Benefits of, of the barn typology is that there's something that comes quite low to the ground, so it has quite a at the edges, quite a friendly presence, um, but then it re- rises to something much taller in the middle. But as we kind of got more into the brief of the project, we began to realise that actually there were quite different functions going on within the building. And rather than having one large extrusion, which was, was almost a, a wall of development for the neighbours, um, we should start thinking of this as a series of connected spaces. And so carving out this uh, barn-like roof um, to define um, the functions that sit within it. So the, the three primary functions being the, the dining hall, the servery and the kitchen. And this kind of very early sketch that um, informed the, the massing of the building, the colonnade running along the western side. And I think a really smart move that we made at competition stage was to uh, collaborate with engineers. We'd been doing work with um, Jane Wernick and her team on a bridge um, earlier that year. Um, and these are some initial sketches that Kate Perver from Jane Wernick's team um, did after a briefing over the phone. And we're kind of really taken by the possibility of structure on this building. And that kind of really fed into our kind of big pitch at the competition, which was this uh, CGI that we had commissioned. Um, and it was really all about how you uh, create a very simple volume uh, that uh, operates very simply in terms of environmental treatment, natural ventilation, natural daylight, um, and that really celebrates the, the structure that holds it up. The following, well, I'm trying to think, uh, four years were going from this vision to then trying to deliver it on site, which um, the great thing was that we had the complete faith and trust of our client um, to deliver it. And their brief after we won the competition was more or less, yes, we like it please get it built, which I'm sure all architects know is easier said than done. But, you know, we're really thrilled to be able to just follow through on that vision. The the kind of last image makes it look very easy, but there's a lot of hard work that went on behind that to uh, transform a a concept for a building into a fully working building and delivering that on a live school site. Uh, So this is a a cross-section through the building, which is on the north-south axis. So the three volumes kind of that we had in the massing sketch still prevail. Um, so at the north end of the building is what the school have termed Great Hall, which is the main dining space. And then sitting in the middle uh, is the uh, small hall, um, which has servery at ground floor level and then a sixth form dining space at mezzanine level above it. Um, and then at the end of the building at the south, um, there's a ground floor level, uh, the commercial kitchen. Above that is a sixth form study space. And in the basement is the plant that makes all of the building uh, work. And the brief kind of did expand quite a bit. So the basement grew and grew as the school were very keen that they get every opportunity to have more storage. Uh, So that's one of the things that expanded throughout the project. Um, And then the vertical circulation for the building is where the kind of valleys are between the volumes. Um, So there's a lift and stair between the great hall and small hall. And then there's a stair up to the sixth form study between the small hall and kitchen block. Um, And that kind of idea of transition from small and low heights to to big spaces uh, really ran through the whole project. We got quite into uh, looking at Lutchen's country houses and the way that he's he's able to take these kind of huge sprawling mansions and actually make them feel very intimate um, and approachable. Uh, So this is the cloister that runs along the building that kind of feels comfortable even for the youngest pupils and then the transition and the big wow I guess is when you go into the great hall which is unashamedly celebratory big space where uh, pupils dine together but also they have kind of events there Um, it's where they have prize giving events Um, so it really kind of becomes this heart space of the school and is is kind of really celebratory about that Um, you know, it's also working quite hard. Um, so it's not just a, an aesthetic 
uh, thing. There's an awful lot of acoustic absorption that was put into the ceilings and that kind of drove a lot of the aesthetic. We really wanted this to be a space where pupils could enjoy their lunch, where they could have a, a good conversation with their peers. Um, so it's really important to get that acoustic insulation in there and to make sure that it was something that was really durable and robust. So it sits behind these oak slats within the, the grid of the um, structure. And this is a view looking up through the uh, the roof light, which brings natural light into the, into the space. Um, so it was designed so that it would be naturally lit for the majority of school hours, um, which has been slightly um, frustrated by the light fittings that were specially commissioned for the project which are so liked by the school that they tend to be on more than they need to be uh, but a lot of building was was about how it works on a day-to-day -day level environmentally driven by a, a natural ventilation strategy so these very big tall spaces uh, produce a really good stack effect and then um, we can discreetly um, located uh, ventilation within the, the wall linings at low level um, for safe nighttime purge ventilation. So we kind of maintain that really strong connection to the um, orchard that sits next to the building. Cloister that runs along the west face gives beneficial shading and also it's this really useful queuing space. I think it's about 60 metres altogether, a covered walkway, uh, which proved really useful during lockdown for socially distanced queuing to get into the dining facilities and then moving through the building into the um, small hall which is actually the biggest of the three volumes um, but still seems to have the small hall uh, moniker and this is where you kind of start to get differentiation between the spaces so at ground floor there's a relatively low and clean um, servery space and above that sits a sixth form dining space um, and we deliberately wanted the servery to be a very calm space uh, so this is a study that we did of the existing dining facilities and the amount of comings and goings that happen at the servery area where you've got um, the cleanup operation or so it's serving and so it's a really busy space so it's deliberately very pared back so it's where you kind of get a breathing space from this very strong timber grid although admittedly we did add our our next grid of of the white tiles um that yeah i mean it, it kind of is a kind of real hustle and bustle space when it's in operation in contrast the mezzanine level that sits above that which is the i guess exclusive location for the six formers who've earned the right to their own kind of private dining space what was really nice about that and that was an addition that came from the client just wanting wanting to get every extra bit of usable space out of the building is that you have a much more direct relationship with the structure and you can kind of see the contrast of the the chairs and the structure just how how massive these glue lamb beams are um, and it's kind of the only point in the building where you get up really close to those also in this uh, small hall we created these bay window booth seats um, we wanted to have opportunities for slightly different dining experiences and this is some of the pupils having their um, afternoon tea um, and it's building that kind of works throughout the day for various different functions but wanted to create these kind of little nooks and crannies within the building for different uses alongside the big volumes but effectively they're all interconnected um, but the acoustic treatment means that you can have very quiet conversations in the small hall even if the, the great hall is kind of fully packed with people dining and actually these booths are most of the time um, taken over by the staff who've kind of taken it on as their dining area. The final volume is the commercial kitchen, which is a kind of very hard working, very high end commercial kitchen um, that kind of brief all the equipment was um, came from the chef who had been a former hotel chef. So it's all incredibly highly serviced and, and quite a thing to kind of squeeze into um, a building. And uh, it was one of the big challenges of the project making that kitchen work. And then this is what, what I kind of call the secret staircase up to the sixth form study space, which was deliberately quite discreetly placed within the building. Uh, again, kind of this idea of the sixth form as having earned the right to this um, special space at the top of the building. Uh, so this takes you up to the sixth form study space, um, which has views out over Richmond Park uh, from a dormer window, very calm paired back palette. We um, did away with the super grid in this space uh, and that was partly driven by a, a very naive um, belief that we could uh, make this space slightly simpler to construct and slightly more straightforward than the more celebratory whole school spaces um, and in reality the timber linings in this space 
took, I think it was twice as long as the small hall and great hall combined uh, for the installation of the timber slats. So a kind of lesson learned for us that actually uh, grids and repetition is really useful. <laughs> Um, and then this is just kind of one of the few images we've got of the basement. This was during construction. Um, so there's actually quite a high uh, groundwater table um, on the site. So it was a real kind of belt and braces, uh, waterproof concrete basement with um, cavity drain system as well. Um, and this, the, the footprint of the basement actually bears very little relationship to the building because uh, we we're dancing around all kinds of root protection zones and, and managed to build the building without um, the loss of any of the adjacent mature trees. Um, so it's a slight anomaly in, in what appears on the surface to be a, a timber building. Uh, a lot of concrete working below it. Um, and the kind of story of the construction is one of the elements of the project that I really enjoy, the, the timber frame being constructed. So this is a view of um, Great Hall being built. Um, so there's a a scaffold frame went up, which held in place the kind of uppermost um, timber ring beam. Um, and then the other members were kind of brought into place. And the whole the whole timber structure was put together by a team of three, uh, a mother, father and son um, from Constructional Timber. Um, I mean, they did have the help of a, a tower crane as well. So it's, it's maybe not quite the, um, the family story that I like to think, but it is kind of incredible that such massive volumes um, can be uh, can be built by such a small team of people when it's all being prefabricated off site and then that kind of story of prefabrication ran through into the internal fit out of the building um, so this is a view of the um the oak linings and acoustic panels being installed and the, the subcontractors did a point cloud survey of the building once it had been built and we tweaked the shadow gaps for all of these diamonds so in total there were only four four unique shapes um, that were repeated across both halls. Um, so they just had to set up four, four jigs in their workshop um, to make all of these diamond and triangle pieces. Uh, and as I said, this, these kind of flew up in comparison to the um, individual slats of the six form study space. And I'm kind of finishing on, on the outside of the building. Kind of strangely for us, it's a building that we almost always talk about the inside, uh, but it, it was also kind of a very rigorous building on the outside. Um, and we're, this is a, a massing model uh, that one of our part did, part one students did for um, the pre-app meeting with local planners, um, all done in red card, uh, just partly out of efficiency and, and concentrating on the massing. But we were really taken by the object quality of the building when we saw it all in one colour. And that kind of really fed through into the specification of the external materials. Uh, so this is constant palette of red that runs through the building. Um, so the standing scene zinc roofs have a have a ready brown tone that that blends quite uh, well with the um the plain clay tile roof and the brickwork and and we kind of felt that having this very limited tonal palette was really helpful in in this very big building um sitting in quite a secondary way to main house which you can kind of just see in the background which actually has a much more articulated palette of brickwork of kind of bright red coins against more of a blended red main brick and we felt that, that was something that was really successful um and then i guess one of my favorite views of the building is one of the very limited views of it from the street um so this is from the the front of main house uh, from the visitors car park um and what i really love about it is that actually it it kind of is a so the building in the foreground the, the lower roof with the, the velux roof lights is part of the original main house this was the staff wing and the chimneys that uh, served the original kitchens um, and then our building just feels like this very natural progression of that within, within the site even with its own chimney which is actually a, a working uh, element of the building not just a folly um, and one of the biggest compliments that I think we had on the building was when I was showing around the alarm uh, subcontractor towards the end of the project who, who literally couldn't believe me that it was a new building um, which for me was a, a kind of real success um, that it kind of had this quality of having been there a long time. And we certainly hope it stays there a long time. Um, and then I guess the final slide, I noticed um, on the kind of holding image that the kind of subtitle was what, what's it take to make a great building? Um, and I guess it takes a lot of hard work, but the, uh, 
a lot of people. So this is the team just from McCrane and Lavington that's been responsible for this building. And I hope that I've captured everyone. Um, but yeah, this is over, a, a, these buildings take a really long time. Um, and they also take clients who are willing to trust their architect and a great team of consultants. So great. Thanks, Tom, for that um, insightful presentation. I mean, it's a lot, I love the great early sketches because they do, they really do illustrate that early thinking uh, behind the design approach. First up, I'd like to ask a couple of my own questions. If that's okay. Yeah. Um, sure. the, the scale of the the scale of the Great Hall is very impressive and probably quite an overwhelming experience for the for the for the children. Um, I mean, have you have you had any input? Um, you know, following the use of the space from 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 the young children, probably the younger children, about whether they find it quite daunting or quite intimate in, in between. I mean, what's What's interesting is that those kind of bay window booths that we did, they were, our idea for those was that they would be for the young pupils who have family service. So they all kind of sit around a table together and then the, the food's brought to them and, and served as if they were at, at home, uh, which I really like. I mean, it's what happened when I was in school back in the day. It's kind of one of my early memories and that kind of really stayed with me. Um, but what's interesting is that that all happens in the Great Hall. And, and the kids love it in there because it is really quiet. Even though it's really big, it's really quiet. And it's the staff who've taken this kind of more intimate space. But I guess, you know, equally we were working, we were designing a building that needed to serve lots of different people, including staff, because everyone has their lunch there, all of the staff in the school. Um, and they all have their lunch kind of side by side. So there's um, some sixth formers having an early lunch, but then the younger children come in and that all kind of happens at the same time really comfortable um but there has been areas of the scheme that have pupils have taken more ownership of and i guess maybe we might do it differently if we did it again so the sixth form study space for example which we had in in mind a kind of very calm library type space has been vamped with uh, quite a bit more color um slightly different furniture um i think that's that's kind of something that yeah if we if we did it again um, possibly more student interaction, but that that wasn't the the brief from the client. The brief was deliver the competition. Yes, yeah, brilliant. And I, and I was going to my next question was it would be good to appreciate if the engagement with the school following the competition win changed any of your initial ideas, and, and if there was anything that you've had to let go of reluctantly. I mean, I think what was quite nice about the building was that we had this this great hall, which just stayed this really pure part of the building. Uh, for the whole process, but the other two volumes, they, they changed a lot. Um, and we, I think, if anything, we were quite keen to keep redesigning it. Um, you know, as architects do, you kind of never feeling like you've quite cracked it or never wanting to believe that you've cracked it. So we uh, you know, went, went off down um, tangents of, oh, well, we should have a different grid structure for, for each of the volumes and we should differentiate them or we should play on the scale of them. And and the client said, no, we, we really liked what you showed us first time around. So can you just can you just do that, please? Um, so if anything, they kind of kept us in check, which was was maybe a good thing because um, sometimes it's easy to get distracted. We've got a few of the questions from the from the audience. Um, um, a question from Megan Thomas: uh, How much were the engineers involved with the design and look of the final building as well as the structure? Uh, well, I mean they're completely fundamental to it really um and the the nice thing about it was that we i mean, don't think we we're particularly asked to bring a design team to the competition um we just kind of realized that if we're going to show a structure it needs to be really convincing it needs to actually work um and then we kind of we also worked with max fordham and they kind of gave us input on the um environmental performance of the building for the competition stage and then we were able to just work with the same design team all the way through and they were appointed right through to the end um so we were together all the way through and yeah that the engineers were very involved in it um and you know it's a building which is it which is a structure basically it's kind of almost all of the building is about that grid um so yeah it was and they were just a great team to work with. And then a question from uh, MH. Um, there's a lot of timber in the project, which gives the spaces a lovely warmth and connection with the natural surroundings. Were there any challenges regarding fire regulations and DDA Quality Act in terms of visual contrast? I mean, in terms of fire regulations, one of the great things about working on schools rather than residential is that you have a bit more flexibility to use 
um, timber and to use it in an exposed way. And we always try and use timber in our school buildings if we can, because of the kind of qualities of the, the natural warmth of it, but also the durability and um, the carbon capture that comes with it. Uh, so we love using timber uh, and it's great to be able to use it on on school buildings. Um, I think, it, you know, there's an increasing nervousness amongst the insurance industry, even with schools. You know, there's no one sleeping in this building, but there's still a kind of nervousness around that. And it, yeah, it does come with it a lot of detailed specification of fire retardant treatments and demonstrating the, the charring effects. So it's, um, it's not an easy solution. Um, but it's a worthwhile solution, I think. So was there another part of that question that I might have? Yes, yeah, yeah, the, uh, the DDA Equality Act in terms yeah. of that visual contrast. Uh, that, that was tricky uh, and we did have to use a couple of different species of timber. So there's um, the, the structure itself is a spruce and then the linings were all done with an oak. Um, but there were elements where we had to introduce a kind of additional um, components to give visual contrast. So it was was a bit of a challenge and we had slightly different floor finishes in some areas to get that visual contrast. I know that some of the members of staff have said that the bits where we do have the visual contrast of so the handrails, for example, are uh, a really dark bronze. Um, they say that they quite like that it's something different, that it's not more wood. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a, a space for everything. And sometimes these regulations do kind of bring benefits to the building that you might not initially see. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Angus Moa Ryan to tell us about the Alice Hall form. This practice was tasked with renovating and extending this heritage listed pub in North Yorkshire. It was the last remaining uh, hostelry in the village that was once in a very important trade hub for the Medieval River Transport Network. So Angus, over to you. Thank, thank you very much, Dave. Um, well, yes, this is a, uh, a story about the last remaining pub in an English village, which was uh, brought back to life by its community. Um, the context is, uh, is the village of Nunmuncton in North Yorkshire. It's a sleepy place uh, with red brick and clay pan tile houses gathered around a green uh, where cattle graze freely and there's a duck pond and a maypole. In fact, uh, it's the tallest maypole in England. The village developed from medieval, uh, from Roman times as a result of being the confluence of two rivers, the meeting point of the rivers Ouse and the river Nid. And as such, it became a tr an important transport hub to the travellers of the, the river network in the north of England. Like a modern day service station, it became somewhere to stop and rest. During medieval times, it had grown to include a priory of nuns and four taverns or pubs. Lord knows what really went on in the village. However, by the 20th century and the invention of the motor car, the village was no longer on the way to anywhere. The ro modern road network had, had bypassed the village, condemning it to become a rural dead end with no passing travellers or trade. The combination of the drink driving regulations, the smoking ban, cheaper online alcohol, and a shift in society towards domesticity meant that where there were once four pubs, there was now only one, the Alice Hawthorne, but then in 2013, even this closed down and our, our client couldn't bear to see this historic grade two listed pub in darkness, even though and even though they were not typical pub drinkers, they felt obliged that, to, to bring it back to life. They felt that the, the heart had been removed from the village by no longer having its pub. And so perhaps in a moment of uh, madness, they, they bought the pub and immediately employed a chef as a way of creating new rev revenue streams. Very quickly, however, they realized that this would not be enough to ensure commercial sustainability. And the rescue plan would also need to add guest rooms so that visited, visitors could once again stay overnight. The local council were initially not very, very supportive of the scheme due to a variety of planning policy and heritage reasons. In fact, at our pre-app inquiry, we received a seven page no. And when the village found out, they mobilized to lend their support. They too had been saddened by the loss of their pub and wanted to see it thrive, even if it needed to change. We undertook an extensive community consultation, including public presentations, an exhibition with comment, the comments book, and even a petition uh, to present to the planning committee, all of which thankfully helped unlock the approval for the project. Our observation of the topography of the village is, is, was that it was characterized by a series of narrow plots behind a necklace of houses facing onto the village green. These rear yards or orchards are known locally as garths. Garth is a Norse term for a grassy cloister, 
or a clearing in the woods. We were also aware of, of the various extraordinary medieval timber frame structures that had once characterised the English countryside. We loved this idea of a grassy cloister and set out to do just that. Our ambition was to both reflect the character of the various informal farmyards which surround the village green, but also to create a sense, a quiet, a sense of quiet enclosure as a notional extension of that village green, as a place of gathering for both people and for animals. We were also conscious that whatever structures we presented in the heritage setting of the village's red brick buildings, these new structures must be sympathetic, but also materially and formally subservient, like the various barns and sheds that were found in those rear yards. After years of making buildings that were often overly layered, we set out to explore a simpler construction typology. Timber framing offered us an opportunity to not only present a highly sustainable low carbon solution, but also a pure and elemental form of construction, whereby the way it is built is the way it looks. Therefore wanted to carefully position our new timber frame structures in this sensitive landscape with the use of authentic agricultural materials, such as galvanized corrugated steel, steel roofing and large cladding to create the feeling that the animals had only recently moved out. It was clear from the start that the architect, engineer and carpenter were all of the same mind. We sought to create a family of similar details, a language of connections and junctions that would readily resolve the requirements of each of the buildings which function structurally in quite different ways. Early meetings and a flurry of sketches quickly result, started to resolve a series of details with, with 200 by 50 timbers acting in pairs to form the stand for the, the primary vertical and horizontal structural elements. The paired space timber posts are held off the ground with steel stainless steel base plates on concrete plinths. I just got my slides wrong there. We, we, uh, we sought details that would be honest and clear, sharp cut timbers, simply bolted, um, and without the reliance on small bits of the metal that so often act as a get out of jail free card when timber details get complicated. We have found that the key to timber detailing is to let the members of the timber swell a fraction, let the nodes separate and consider elements formed of multiple members which are interleaved. The Douglas fir uh, frames were prefabricated as components. The Douglas frame for, uh, uh, for frames were prefabricated as components and assembled as two dimensional layups at Timber Workshop in Devon. Traditional carpentry techniques were used alongside more modern riggers and jigs to aid the repeated nature of the, of the structure. This prefabrication process allowed each of the buildings to be, take only approximately one week to erect on site. And once cloaked in the sarking, allowed for both internal and external teams to make progress simultaneously, thereby cutting typical site times. The field barn is a two-story structure facing the pub with four ensuite guest bedrooms divided by a central staircase. It has an elevated truss structure to allow for a sectional offset in order to con continue the colonnade. The single story stables run along the east boundary and has three generous ensuite guest bedrooms with a sheltered colonnade of timber columns. The tack room is a smaller uh, single story building along the west boundary, similar to stables, with a, chair, a wheelchair accessible ensuite guest bedroom. It extends to shelter the outdoor kitchen, pizza oven and garden bar. Lining the driveway is the sheds, a single story infill with bedrooms for overnight staff, linen store, laundry and cleaners room. The environmental, environmental impact has been mitigated by ensuring that the external larch cladding is FSC certified and the internal popular fire shield plywood sarking is PEFC certified. The Douglas fir structural uh, timber framing has come from a well-managed estate with a replanting program in the north of England, which in being grown locally is relatively low carbon in terms of road miles from source to site compared to imported timber. Within the wall, wall and roof assemblies, magply, a non-combustible sheathing board, is used as a fire barrier. Subtle distinctions between timber species are blurred by a tinted envirograph intumescent coating. The objective was always to deliver a low energy strategy by means of a ground source heat pump to provide heating and hot water supplied by boreholes and supported by high levels of non-combustible mineral in, mineral insulation and air tightness to a higher standard than current building regulations. A natural ventilation strategy was preferred by means of high level 
by, by means of high level clear story windows and roof lights on actuators. Solar gain is reduced by means of overhangs, which offer shading. LED and low energy lighting and low water appliances, including WCs, are specified throughout. The project committed to an energy review on completion, scoring an EPCA rating. The building emissions rates are estimated to be 45 kilograms of CO2 per cubic meter per, per square meter per year. And the primary energy use estimated to be 250 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. The sustainable drainage system was also engaged using a, a permeable cell track gra uh, gravel surfacing in the car park and surface water attenuation tanks concealed below the pub garden. Cycle stands are provided for guest and staff use. Provision for electric car charging points were fitted to the car park. Extensive new planting and habitat creation aim to, to improve biodiversity biodiversity across the site. Each room is announced externally by a hand-painted motif of the room names, such as saddle, stirrup, flax, barley, wheat and hay. The front is taken from old agricultural seed bags. And the only decorations on the walls are, are lino cut prints undertaken by the village primary school children. They also have a vegetable patch at the back of the garth. And so this is how we save the Alice Hawthorne for future generations. The lights are back on, and it's back in service for its community and has ensured that an overnight tavern has once again been reinstated to Nunmonkton. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, thanks Angus. Um, what a fantastic history to, to build on and demonstrates the strength of a community to save our heritage and culture for, for future generations. I'd like to ask um, um, a few things, something. Um, is this a blueprint model for other struggling pubs and, and venues in remote villages where they can become rural destinations to visit and, and stay over. And this is now an emerging typology in your practice. Uh, that's a great question. I'd like to think it is a, 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 a something that other villages and other rural communities could pick up on. That would be great. Um, obviously, it does require a lot of investment and a lot of energy and a lot of kind of cohesiveness in the community to do it. And, and so, you know, I don't think it's something you can transpose to any village. I think the village has to be mobilised in order to do, it, to do it and it needs then a champion in in the form of a, um, a well-organized and resourceful client to see it through but i think it is something you know we've all been through um kind of extraordinary times in recent years uh, you know as you know, pubs have already been in decline i don't know how many it is that that close uh, weekly i think that the the village did well to to come together in the pandemic as well to do this you know you have to consider that the behaviors around pubs uh, were badly hit by the pandemic and this was a project that was conceived during the pandemic and managed to come out the other side of it so i think it is an interesting whether it's a, a typology now that we um that we haven't got any other pub projects but we have um started to be very very interested in timber frame so i think timber framing uh for us has become something that we're, we're, we're super interested in as i said in my presentation there was uh something about the elemental nature of the way that timber framing leads you to build make buildings which uh we find fascinating i think a lot of buildings uh, get um they have their structure and then they spend a lot of time covering up that structure or, or adding layer further layers on top and i think what we particularly enjoyed about this project was the uh, direct relationship between the way it looks is the way it is and 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 uh, the way it's constructed is the way it is should, should i say yeah, it's a it's a naked building, isn't it? Which is what uh, what works really well in terms of that warmth and uh, and comfort. Um, I mean, there's no doubt this project is an exemplar for a low energy, low carbon approach. So, what has your practice taken away to help convince other clients to invest and build on this work, and also to reset their own targets towards sustainability, net zero designs? Uh, what have we, I mean, I think, as I say, for us, it's a bit of an entry project insofar as it's our first pure total timber frame project. So I think we, we, we there's been a lot of lessons learned from us, for us on this project, which we hopefully will take through to other projects. It does take, I think, a particular client to help commission a building like this. I don't think, um, I mean, Tom mentioned it earlier in terms of the insurance and nervousness around um, timber. Um I think it does. It, it's something that we can now prove through example. We can show them this project and, and tell them about it. But I do think it takes a, a certain kind of client to come with you on it. So I don't think it's something we can necessarily assume that we'll do it on all our projects. But I think it's fascinating um, that 
it, it's done so well environmentally and my understanding is the running costs are exceptionally low on it as a result mm -hmm. of being well insulated and um, having the ground source heat pumps and so forth i think all of these things have, have meant that the uh, commerciality the kind of the sustain the financial sustainability of the pub is also further improved by having lower costs so um I so, no it, it, was, it was very much about um you know i guess it's, it's trying to get clients to as you said to sort of appreciate that this is this is a you know this is a sort of way forward when working with with projects of a scale where both social economic and also environmental sustainability comes together and it's yeah. always a challenge about how do we convince convince bringing this into all of our projects going forward now yeah well i'd like to think it's our starting point maybe it's becoming our default and have to see how how we can yeah. make each project uh, you know um, be Come, you know, hold up to those standards. Yeah, it's been a great research and development project for you in that in that case, in terms of you know le learning about the sort of technical parameters of working with this material. Um, I mean, we've got some questions coming in from our audience. So here's one from um, you and Hopper. What was the procurement process for the project? Uh, the procurement process in terms of uh, from architect or from the uh, contractors. I assume if, in terms of architect, we were lucky to to be in the right place at the right time. We'd, we'd uh, recently finished um, the refurbishment of the York Theatre Royal, and our client there was the York Conservation Trust, and um, they have an, uh, an in-house architect, and he had become our client on the theatre project. And very fortunately, a few years previously, he'd done a feasibility study um, for, for the, the, the pub, and then said, well, I can't do this now, but I can tell you someone who can. And so we were lucky, it's, you know, it's a private commission. It wasn't an open competition. We just happened to be in the right place at the right time. In terms of the uh, procurement of the contractor, um, it was a traditional JCT contract, um, but uh, it, in actually it was done on a negotiated um, fashion. Uh, we, we did intend to go out to uh, tender um, but there was a local firm that our client was very, very keen to use. And um, so we used, uh, we worked very closely with them to negotiate um, a, a contract with them, actually. And that was uh, uh, particularly useful because it meant we were allowed to have much of a warm, much warmer, more direct relationship with that contractor. Um, in particular, the uh, timber frame uh, it allowed us to bring them on very, very early. And I think that was also a special characteristic of this project was that the um, we were able through the design phases, the, the kind of diesel design phase, to be working both, I, I mentioned about architect, engineer and carpenter, all um, all in the same meeting. So a lot of what we discussed was about just resolving uh, what, what the ambition was and then actually how we were going to resolve it technically and having the carpenter in on that conversation, uh, which is a company called Timber Workshop um, in Devon, which I thoroughly recommend to anyone who's interested in timber framing. Uh, they were brilliant. Very realistic approach from the outset working with, yeah, working so, with. so quite unusual in that sense because you know yeah. in in a, in a traditional procurement um ten, we get tendered of course and you know you'd meet you'd meet who you're working with um after that process and then slightly you're at you're at sort of a, not a loggerheads but you are more distanced from the contractor in, in that situation so it was very but it was very uh, um a, a kind of collaborative partnership between contractor fabricator engineer and architect Brilliant. Uh, uh, one more question from the audience before we bring Tom back in um, is from, from MH. I noticed from the photos internal partitions don't go toward height in the accommodation wing. How are the acoustics uh, addressed in this in this block in the accommodation wing? Well, there's, there's three. Well, there are three buildings there. Acoustically, um, the it's one of those things that when you look at the photographs, it all just looks like we've just put some timber framing up primary and secondary timber framing and then socked over it with the um, with the fire shield plywood. And actually, what's happening behind that, there's quite a lot of stuff going on, uh, both in the floor, the ceiling and the walls, um, not just from an acoustic point of view. So, of course, it's a hotel in essence. I mean, we call it a tavern or a pub, but actually it's a hotel. And when, with any hotel, you need to be able to make sure that you can't hear sound from one room to another room. Uh, that's relatively difficult to do with timber framing if unless you stagger the stagger the walls and so forth but actually behind that sarking there's quite a lot of dense material and separation to make sure that the, the rooms are acoustically separated from each other 
So, um, and we did a sound test at the end to make sure that it was compliant. So they are, each one of those um, rooms is a sort of an acoustically separate shell from, from the next one. Um, in terms of the environmental kind of the, the general sense of the acoustic, um, we didn't really do anything other than allow for, you know, we had a carpet on the floor that's soft and soft furnishings. Um, and then it's really just the, the the resonance that comes off the exposed timber rafters and, and studs and the plywood. And actually, it's a very, very soft uh, acoustic. I think we could sort of maybe stumbled into that a little bit in the sense we didn't model that necessarily acoustically, but it, they aren't, they're not hard spaces to be in. They're very soft and natural feeling. Yeah, brilliant. There's a, there's a lovely comment here from Rachel saying, very pleased that a wheelchair accessible restroom will be included as part of the, part of the accommodation. So um, I'd like to welcome back uh, Tom and, and perhaps start with a question for, for both of you in that both of these projects demonstrate a very crafty beauty and sustainable benefit of using, using timber. Uh, but did you consider other materials like uh, GGBS concrete or recycled steel as a robust low maintenance alternative? I mean, essentially, no. Um, we kind of always wanted the, the hall to be timber. Um, and kind of felt that there, you know, there's just something inherently familiar about a big timber hall. I, I mean, they kept some of the slides that Angus was showing as well. It's I think it's just kind of in in the British psyche this idea of the big grand timber hall. So I think certainly for the hall spaces, um, you know, we didn't think about something else. I think one of the big lessons learned for us um, on the project was about the impact of the basement. Uh, and I kind of mentioned that we used waterproof concrete and kind of went belt and braces on it. I think that was one of those moments where you just we were just completely focused on high water table, got to make sure this doesn't leak. Yes. Um, and we didn't do um, carbon assessments on this building until we entered it for the Reba Awards. Um, very different, uh, very different world today. You know, we'd be doing it from day one. And we we're kind of just stunned that the waterproof concrete was, was twice as carbon intensive as regular concrete. So you know, there's a lot of lessons in terms of thinking very, you know, if we're doing it now, we'd think very differently about the um, impact of carbon on the building, on all elements of it, not just kind of thinking, well, it's a basement, it has to be concrete. There's there's concrete and there's concrete, I think is what we've learned. Yeah. Great. And uh, just a couple of questions that have come in, uh, came in earlier, um, which I think do apply to, I guess, both of you, starting with Angus. Um, I mean, the, the wood structure, is it laminated timber or solid wood? Uh, so the, the primary structure is all uh, glue lamp timber uh, and then there's a CLT deck that sits over the top of that um, which helped to reduce some of the the depth of the glue lamp structure uh, kind of has a diaphragm action on it. Um, I have to say I'm kind of completely in awe of um, Angus's very pure solid wood construction. Um, I, yeah there, there were certainly elements of Ibstock that um, were not as pure as the Alice Hawthorne, um, where we, we had to rely on some steel elements and, you know, it's not a completely timber frame building. Yeah. So uh, it's interesting, because the, 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 I'm going to come back to your original question about whether we would have done anything in any other way, uh, yes. you know, or the other materials, because actually there was a moment in our project where we have two boundaries where, we're, you know, the buildings are in, within one metre of the boundaries. And, you know, as everyone knows, probably on this um, on this call, uh, you need to achieve one hour fire resistance. Now, the, the lazy thing for us to do at that point probably would have been just to throw up a block work wall around the but down the boundaries and not really bothered with the timber frame, you know. And I think we might have got away with it. Maybe no one have noticed it. But actually, we wanted it to be. You know, we, we set this ambition of it being sufficiently pure in terms of its solid timber that we then went about looking about well, how do you make a one hour fire resisting timber frame wall? And it can be done. You just need to, you know, layer the layer the uh, beyond the timber structure. You obviously the timber structure in itself has a kind of charring quality that it's designed to. But actually, in terms of the spread of flame from either the outside in or the inside out, there are lots of products you can bring together with timber frame to 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 get that resistance. And there's a fantastic material. I mentioned it um, in the presentation called Magply. Uh, which is a sort of cementitious sort of board. I'm not quite sure what it is, but it's one and one hour, 20 minutes um, fire resisting. So if you use that in your wall buildups as as a sort of sarking, it acts as a kind of fire check between the inside out and the outside in. 
Um, yeah. So that was a huge revelation for us and discovering that that's a, a material or a sheet material that we wouldn't have discovered, I don't think, on our own. It only came as a result of talking with the timber frame company that we got introduced to it. And uh, that's something we've taken with us onto other projects. Yeah. And it was um, any question from Esther saying, you know, how do you how do you deal with any increase in the fly performances to the external envelope due to proximity to the site boundary? So that certainly sort of demonstrates uh, that it, 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 can, it can be done. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, we in effect, you know, what what would have been a you know a masonry block work wall for, for ease of fire resistance became a a magply um, uh, um, sheathing, which had the same same fire resistance. Um, and obviously, when you're looking at fire, you've got um, you've got the that that spread of fire or you know the protection of along the boundary, but also surface spread of flame internally. So how do you have a whole building lined in plywood and 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 um, natural timber? Well. The plywood you can get as a, in a fire shield uh, variety is a very good um, fire shield poplar ply which we used um, and then we used an envirograph um, treatment which is a brush treatment over the um, over the all of it which then actually brought these various timbers together so the, the timber structure is Douglas fir um, the cladding is is, is larch Siberian larch and the, um, the the plywood is a popular plywood and by applying that intumescent um, wash it kind of brought it all together into a single finish yes yeah that's great that's, that's great to know and um just in, in terms of i mean a question for, for both of you i mean uh, from howie uh, which which projects are you currently working on yes yeah, so, uh, well i'm just about to um submit for planning a, a new build primary school um which very excited by I mean, it's complete uh different end of the spectrum to ipstock in terms of its um very compact site and having to work over multiple stories um i guess the big question on that one is whether we can direct it down a, a timber route which we'd really like to do well very excitingly we've um we've got a project in hollyhead um on the island of anglesey uh, um, it's an art center called a Keldra, and it's been um, a bit of a slow cooked pro project but it's finally got its final piece of funding um, which is the levelling up funding and amongst other various funding pots and that's uh, a project we're doing in timber um, it's got it it, uh, it started its life as a CLT series of shells um, and it's now I think uh, probably as a result of the Alice Hawthorne we're going to move away from CLT into a more elemental framed approach so um, the, you know, this is sort of maybe in answer to your kind of question about continuity in other projects, this is something that we're now looking to try and bring some of the things we've learned at the Alice into that project. And that yeah. will have um, a dance studio, uh, an art workshop, um, changing rooms and dressing rooms for, a, for an art centre, extending an, art, an existing art centre. So that's a very exciting project for us. Fantastic to hear. And, and, and I mean, both projects do, you know, have demonstrated a, a sort of prefabricated method of construction which, you know, I think Tom mentioned earlier on that with, with, with timber structures is something that can be done off site and, and therefore, you know, uh, minimizing site wastage um, and, and so on. So are you finding that this is the way going forward that it's, it's bringing prefabrication methods along with traditional materials to, to try and, you know, uh, lower body carbon? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we don't just kind of do it from a carbon perspective, although obviously it's really useful. I mean, on all, all of the schools that I've done at McCrane Lambton, they've all been timber and a lot of the time is just because they're often live sites and it's a really kind of quiet and clean way of constructing when you're right next to um people who are trying to learn um, so you can take a lot of the the noise and, and mess away from from the live school site and then um yeah speed up construction on site so it's got multiple benefits yeah. um, i'd always like to use timber if i could well i was just going to say i was going to say the same thing the site benefits in terms of the um you know the site time you, you get that timber frame on site you can work you you, you get a, a sheathing around it you can work inside and so outside simultaneously yes but also yeah. the quality you know if you make something in a workshop especially with carpentry what you bring to site is something that can't be re replicated by site work so it's it's a very it's a very um uh, there, you know, despite being a traditional technique, there are lots of modern advantages, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I'm afraid we've run out of time. Uh, many thanks to our special guests, uh, Tom Radico and Angus Moran-Ryan, for their wonderful talks. 